Howdy, y'all. Welcome to another session of the Talent War Group. We're going to give you guys time here to uh, trickle in, and then we'll uh, we'll kick it off. So just give us about one minute here as people start to uh, to join. But welcome. Mike, what do you think our delay is going to be today from us live to the time it hits the interwebs? 10 oh. seconds, 15? Actually, I've, I think I've seen it longer. Will, what are, it's about 30 seconds sometimes. We'll see. Welcome, guys. I'm starting to see you trickle in. We're, we're just giving it a few moments here for, uh, for more uh, viewers to, uh, to join. Uh, we got Don, Donnie uh, Oliver signing in. He said, time to spitfire. Let's get it on. Okay. Hey, guys. Welcome. Uh, I know some of you are, you are uh, joining. My name is Mike Sorelli. I'm with Talent War Group. Um, I am actually extremely excited about this episode. Not only do I have some great friends, mentors on, uh, all former military members who, who made the the massive leap into venture, and they've been wildly uh, successful. You know, one of the things that's big to me is credibility. And credibility takes a long time to earn. And each of these members have credibility in this space. So, you know, even though I'm kicking off the uh, as the host of this, I'm going to turn it over to Glenn Cowan, who, who's going to lead it. I I'm actually going to learn a lot from, uh, from this panel. And that's the whole point. It, it, you know, this is a two-way street. There, there's going to be some great questions in here from you people. We'd love to talk about uh, topics within venture vesting and how special operations applies to that. And when we use special operations, I don't want you guys to think that this, this is just pertains to special operations. Special operations whole foundation came from the military. So when we say special operations, we're really talking about mission planning from the, uh, the military. So I'm going to do some quick introductions. One, Glenn Cowan, who's the host of this. He is the founder of One Nine Venture Partners. Glenn is, he likes to call himself the lone Canadian, uh, served in Canadian special operations. I knew him when he was active and I was active, became good friends. Next to him is uh, Michelle, uh, who is the EF Overwatch digital uh, marketing associate, kicking butt. She's coming on full time as of uh, January because she showed us something that we just absolutely loved. Fran, Fran is a, a good friend. Uh, former Army Special For uh, Forces uh, officer, uh, MBA, and then went on to crush it in the private sector, uh, holding a number of C-suite positions. Tom Hall. Tom Hall is a great story. 75th Ranger Regiment, which, guys, if anyone asks me what's the best special operations unit out there, I will always say the 75th Ranger Regiment. That kills SEALs when I say, say it, but worked with them. Love that element. Uh, the global war on terror was uh, revolutionary. Uh, for their their foundation. But Tom also, after the 75th Ranger, Ranger Regiment, went on to play football at Iowa State, finished his degree, and then make the leap into business. Joseph Kops are joining us for the first time. I knew Joseph during my last two years on active duty. He was already retired from the Army. West Pointer uh, had sold his company within 18 months of coming on active uh, off active duty. If you tell me that applying the military, uh, you know, set of leadership strategies and tactics to creating a successful business and selling that 18 months after you retire is not a recipe for uh, for success. I don't know what it is, and Joseph's going to talk about that today. Chris Palmisano, uh, Marine Corps officer, uh, he is an adjunct professor at St. Edwards, which happens to be Michelle's uh, university as well, where he talks about and teaches about small business and uh, and venture. And he is the COO and CRO of Rocket Dollar, an amazing company that's disrupting uh, fintech. And then Jim Brown, another mentor who I met on active duty, Arena Growth Partners founder, West Point graduate, combat aviator from the Army, MBA, and has also cut his teeth in venture. Guys, I'm not even doing you justice, but Glenn, let me turn it over to you. Roger that, Mike. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, we are live. Uh, that is my best Bruce Buffer, uh, and I've recently become a big reintroduced fan to the UFC, uh, really because one of my portfolio companies that's scaling rapidly right now recently signed a multi-year global uh, partnership agreement with Dana White and the UFC. And it's been really exciting to watch this company grow 
uh, and gained some mainstream traction. The company's called O2 Industries and manufactures the world's best respiratory protection, uh, specifically for our, our service men and women. I got inv uh, involved and interested in venture investing uh, from a pretty young age. Um, I had a grandfather that didn't want to take me fishing. He would sit me on his knee and make me read stock charts um, and really got an, an active sort of interest in investing. But while I was on active service in a special operations unit, I, I really sort of found that special forces soldiers are some of the best problem solvers I've, I've ever met. And when we're looking at venture investing and the ideas of you know, you know, how we can use technology and innovation. The first question is, what problem are you solving? And, you know, the reality is our forward deployed men and women uh, are seeing problems a lot of the time before the rest of us even know their problems. And I've become an advocate and a, and a staunch believer in the fact that a special operations unit is probably one of the best incubators and technological accelerators that exists. And there's not a lot of access to private investors into that community. So I built one nine investments uh, with sort of a focused thesis on identifying, incubating and speeding to market technologies that not only aid our men and women in uniform in solving some of our nation's greatest uh, problems and challenges, but also dual use and allow us to scale in the commercial sector. <clears throat> so why is, there, why is it a parallel? Uh, between special operations mission planning and venture investing. And I would kind of sum it up by saying, you know, at the end of the day, it's a precise deployment and application of resources at a specific time and place um, to achieve a very specific effect in a high risk, high reward environment. When we would conduct direct action operations against terrorist leadership, we were, you know, launching in a very high risk a uh, high reward scenario. We were intelligence led. We were uh, focused and mission focused driven. And we didn't want to stick around too long uh, because generally, you know, we needed to extract ourselves before a point in time where we sort of hit critical vulnerability. And I see the same types of parallels, thought process and methodology behind venture investing. Heavily reliant on planning, risk mitigation, contingency planning, supporting plans, and building the team around you of subject matter experts to really help you grow and thrive, not only the venture business, but also working with the companies that you're investing in, working with those founders and helping them grow and scale. And so for the, por for the purpose of this conversation, I'm delighted to be joined by such a sort of distinguished group of military veterans, uh, special operators, and really successful business um, perspectives, not only from the venture side, but also as you'll see from the founder and startup side as well. So for the purpose of the talent war, where we speak about leadership, talent, human capital is some of the, the most prized possessions uh, in a business, we will really focus that discussion on what investors and founders can do to sort of seek out talent, make an investment in a team, where you have a limited amount of time to get to know a, a team, a leadership methodology, uh, a management style, and that team's ability to execute. It is that assessment of talent in conjunction with the deployment of capital uh, that can really help um, you know, the, the founders, the startup community, and that specific company to grow and achieve scale. And so with that, um, you know, we're going to turn it over to the panel where, you know, our members are going to have some anecdotes from their experience. And we really hope that that helps to drive, uh, you know, active audience engagement, ask great questions uh, and take advantage of some of the experience that we have on the panel. And so, uh, Mike, just going to kind of throw it back over to you and, um, you know, lead with, uh, you know, an anecdote on, on the venture side. Let me unmute here. So, you know, let me take it from a more holistic uh, view. Um, I've had a number of ventures, uh, not necessarily investing, and actually Joseph helped me uh, early on with my first social venture, which was probably one of the uh, the greatest lessons learned. But beyond military planning, uh, really, you know, and I'm very biased, man. I'm 
because I served for such great mentors in, in the military from McRaven to Jocko Willing to guys like Joseph Kopser and, 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 and the people on here, uh, really they, they taught me how to run operations. And I think that's what's, what's missing. And I was born in Silicon Valley, know a lot of startup owners, uh, you know, go out there all the time. One of the things I see missing in a lot of ventures is a rigor, discipline, and focus in terms of running operations. There's a lot of great people that have amazing ideas, and I'm never the idea guy, and that doesn't hurt my ego whatsoever. But there's something special about um, a, a, a military member that truly understands how to run operations and keep a organization matrix-driven, running in the right direction, making sure that the right things are, are, are done so that you increase the probabilities that that venture is gonna be successful. And I think that's the one thing I bring to, to businesses, not the idea, but a rigor, a discipline, and a focus to make sure that the right decisions are being made and the organization's moving forward. Let me uh, let me pause there and I'll turn it over to uh, Joseph for the, uh, the next comments. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, and what I think is so key about this, and let's also tie it back, not just the discussion about raising money, uh, which is what so many people probably tuned in for, but I want to go back to what you and Glenn were saying earlier about the talent side of it. If there was one experience that I had in raising money for my first company or the subsequent nonprofits and other ventures that I was raising money for, it always came down to the personal relationship between you and your team with whomever you were talking to, uh, whether it be potential investors, connectors, warm introduction. And I'll be quick on this first because uh, I know there's a lot of us that want to share thoughts. I'll be quick to point out one thing that entrepreneurs, especially young entrepreneurs, always forget is that your first impression is immediately when the discussion about them investing in you and your team begins. And what I mean by that, it's they're measuring you by every email. They're measuring you by every exchange. They're measuring you by how you're treating their team. Entrepreneurs always get confused. They think, oh, I got to talk to the top dog or the big VC or in military parlance, I got to talk to the colonel or the general or whatever. But it's the NCO that's making it happen. It's the analyst on that team that's making it happen. And trust me, karma We'll catch up with you if you're not treating the team right. So that's something I think early uh, veterans don't quite understand as they get into the, uh, into the fundraising space. And even civilians don't quite understand about their own industries is that how you treat other people uh, matters. And as you go through this fundraising world, your reputation will precede you. So that's the first thing I'd say. Uh, more importantly, I look forward to hearing what everybody else has to say. Oh, Jim, you're on mute, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'll jump in and uh, follow Joseph and, and all great comments so far. Just for um, context, as uh, Mike said, I, I went to West Point and was an aviator uh, in the military. I was fortunate enough to do some um, special operations missions with 75th Rangers and um, some SEALs and um, uh, first SF group and some others. Um, and then went to law school and business school and really got into the venture business um, because of business school. Uh, they said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And uh, I said, I was an engineer. And so I like technology. Uh, I was in the military, so I love leadership. Um, and I was really interested in what I was calling at the time economic development. And they said, uh, oh, you want to be a venture capitalist? And my response was, what's that? Um, but um, was fortunate to get into it and, and have spent uh, my entire career um, either in the early stage uh, investment business or as a CEO. And one of the things that is key as a venture capitalist, which is also key um, as an aviator and in the military generally, is we think about um, ingress, egress, uh, mission, and capabilities. And so <clears throat> in the business world, um, that's how do you get in uh, as an investor? Uh, how do you get out as an investor? What resources do you have available to accomplish your objectives while you're there? Um, and in the military, what we would do is we would define our uh, must-haves and our nice-to-haves in terms of resources and capabilities. And then we'd fundamentally take those things away um, in training to prepare us uh, for what we needed to do um, when we didn't have uh, those particular resources. And in particular, what we thought were must-have resources. And I think one of the things that uh, founders fail to do in their planning is the contingency planning on the assumption that they'll always have capital 
or they'll always have an open market, or they'll always have one thing or another uh, that tends to be taken away. Um, and then the last piece is once you figure out uh, whether you're a venture capitalist or a founder or someone in the C-suite, how you're going to get in, how you're going to get out, what your goals and objectives are, and taking a uh, fierce and relentless inventory of your resources uh, and planning, um, then you have to figure out what the capabilities of your team are. Um, no team has uh, one group um, that can do everything at the highest level. Um, even um, on a team of all-star players, which is often what you find in special operations, everyone plays their role. Everyone has a particular area of expertise uh, where they're uh, able to dive down. And as a CEO, uh, my goal was to create an environment where the best people could do their best work, to get them excited about what we were doing, to get them excited about the fact that we had resources and we would have resources and capabilities to allow them to achieve uh, their highest and best use and potential, and then create a culture and an environment where uh, they could achieve those ends. Um, and the founders' roles, uh, sometimes in the C-suite, but often uh, they grow out of it, um, is to remain uh, the cultural soul, if you will, um, of the organization. Um, they're the ones who are the most mission-driven, they're the most passionate. And as a leader, finding out a way to channel that um, to get away from the ego, to actually give them enough confidence to be vulnerable and humble, to say, hey, I don't know this, um, or to point out things that they even don't know that they don't know. Uh, and they incorporate that information, much like we did in the military, in real time uh, to take advantage of opportunities uh, we may not have known existed, or to mitigate threats we may not have known existed. Uh, that's the key to success. So you plan, uh, you scenario plan, uh, and then you remain flexible as you get new information. And I found that those are the fundamentals that uh, I've seen consistently in successful investments that uh, I've been able to make and have been missing um, in unsuccessful investments I've been able to make. I often joke that um, I've invested in companies that many of you may have heard of, and I've invested in some companies that I wished I'd never heard of. Uh, but um, those fundamentals um, tend to um, be the indicators of success, both in good investments and in ones that don't go as well as we hoped. And I'm going to turn it over to Fran here. But before we do, hey, folks, again, this is a wealth uh, of experience. And I, I'd probably say to say a lot of failures amongst those, uh, those experiences. And so this is your opportunity to dive into this group. If you have questions or even comments on things they're saying, please add them to the comments section. Uh, this is your opportunity. Fran? Over to you. All right, thanks, Mike. So I take it uh, this con con conversation in the context of it from the perspective, much more from an operations point of view. Uh, I come from a background as a Green Beret, uh, where no problem is too large. Um, you know, all the solutions are out there. You just have to find the right people to solve them. And I've had the fortunate opportunity uh, since I got out to. Uh, serve at a company that was at the, uh, the, you know, just had gone public in the late stage, you know, rapid growth. And I've been at the other end of that, uh, at, you know, early stage, um, you know, er early stage startup trying to achieve rapid growth. And what I've figured out through those experiences is that what they teach you in business school about the different, um, the different phases of the business cycle is true. And it takes a different type of team at each one of those phases of the business cycle to achieve success in each, in each phase. And so I had a commander uh, when I was a general's aide, my the general used to say, what got you here won't get you there. And I thought about that so many times because it's so true that the different teams that are required, whether you have to come up with all the ideas to start a business or now you have to be the ones to uh, operationalize it and still process and still procedure and rapidly grow it uh, versus once you get to a steady state uh, are all different. And you have to identify that talent. And the military does a great job of teaching you this because they change leadership every two to three years maximum. In some organizations, they change leadership every year. So you're always iterating. You're always moving forward. You're always moving towards a new goal. For me as a second lieutenant, I learned this when I, the day I walked in to my infantry platoon when I graduated ranger school. I walked in the door. We had a new battalion commander who had come from 75th Ranger Regiment, and we were going to Iraq in four months' time, and there were no Ranger-qualified platoon leaders until I walked in the door. And I walked in the door, and he fired a guy that day. 
and immediately said, we're going to war. I need my platoon leaders to be Ranger qualified. That's what's going to happen. And if they can't cut it, they're getting fired. And so that was a lesson that I took from that experience that says that you have to assess talent towards the future and how you invest in that team, looking towards those next phases of your of your business, of your operation is what's going to set you up for success. Hey, this is Chris Palmisano. Uh, I'll add a little bit to that perspective uh, as a recent founder uh, who's gone through the fundraising process to include during coronavirus. I also sat on uh, both sides of the table, been a venture partner and an angel investor, so I know what, it, what it's like to wear that investor hat. But just like your commander is constantly looking for new intel and new information to build a more complete picture, uh, as you're fundraising as a, a founder or on a founding team, uh, you do the same thing. Uh, so as you're out early on meeting investors or meeting prospective investors, you're learning about the market. Uh, and you're seeing what the market will bear. You're seeing what investors are looking for. Uh, you're collecting data and intelligence on what size rounds are getting done and what valuations. Uh, and this information is all extremely helpful, uh, extremely helpful as a founder. Uh, it starts to help you build the picture so that you too can make better decisions uh, so that you can execute more effectively both in your fundraise uh, and then thereafter. Uh, and then a couple of other things that I'd add is that the fundraising process, uh, it can be very long, it can be very draining, uh, but this is, uh, you know, something that's very, uh, very familiar to the military audience. Uh, you have a goal uh, and you have a mission and you stay focused on the mission uh, and then rely on your team. Uh, and so nobody does anything in a vacuum. The same thing with the founding team. Uh, we had uh, a founding team of five people. Uh, and so we were able to spread, uh, spread some of that responsibility and spread the load. Um, so uh, the same teamwork that you uh, relied on when you were in the military, whether in the special operations community or uh, in the military at large, uh, what's what wins today in the military? It's what wins today here uh, on the ground as a founder uh, and an entrepreneur fundraising. Awesome, thanks, Chris. Uh, first off, everybody here has made great points. So my my list has been checked off this entire time. All these different topics covered. So it's it's awesome to hear such a wealth of knowledge coming into this. What, what I would add is something I learned from special operations and the military in general that is really carried over to startups, and it's something that you'll find in almost every single book on leadership from the military is people. With special operations, one night you might be up in the mountains freezing your butt off. The next night you might be in a valley sweating in triple digit weather. You really have to be adaptable and malleable to all these different situations. And kind of as they flow, you might have a follow on target one night, you might not. So when you come over into startups, the biggest thing I've seen so far is the people. Having leaders in place that can adapt to these kind of fluid situations. The, the first company that I co-founded, we took about a year working on the same product and service and eventually had to shift it in about one week's time to an entirely different product and service. It was, it was that ability to pivot and be flexible and kind of change with the situations and the scenarios that really made us successful. And it's really what I've seen in different startups that have been successful is the people being able to kind of roll with things and go with the flow. The ones that have had those more rigid leaders in place that can adapt or can't find the right leaders underneath them um, to attack different situations, those have been the ones that have kind of gone stagnant. So for me, the biggest thing for the military is, is people. So that's kind of adds on to a little bit of what everybody else has said, but um, I think it's critical. Hey, Tom, thank you for that. We're, we're getting some great questions and, and I want to dive right into them. Uh, this one has come in, I believe, from Kevin uh, Ashman. And if I'm mispronouncing your names, I, I do genuinely apologize. Uh, Kevin is a growth executive and investor. His question is, I'd like to hear the group's thoughts on how the rigor tied to operational planning and any tactics or examples would be great that have helped mitigate the risk and scrutiny of VCs often take to their investments uh, leadership. Um, let me pass it over to Glenn first, and then I think Joseph wants to weigh in. Glenn? Kevin, thanks for the question. Uh, this alone could consume eight hours of, uh, of discussion. Uh, I recently spoke um, a keynote discussion at a, at a venture forum where I used the analogy of hey-ho operations, high altitude, high opening uh, parachute operations, which is a really complex insertion method for special operations to get a team onto the ground. And I've tied that to sort of an analogy that I use uh, for the planning uh, and, and, and tactics and, and, and supporting mechanisms to help 
uh, with the planning aspect. And I think what makes special operations special is, is not a combination of eliteness or anything that you, you might read from sort of a Hollywood perspective, but it's an ability to do the basics brilliantly. And so uh, one of the key fundamental characteristics of that is keep it simple. So anything that you can keep simple, including your planning process, I think aids in your ability to kind of flush it out. And, and to Mike's point at the start of our discussion, special operations community draws all of its planning doctrine from the big army and from the military writ large. And there's a process uh, that, that we use called the estimate process. And in that process, we're doing a factors analysis where we kind of write out every factor that we're going to need to deal with as part of our plan. And in the military, it might have been, what's the enemy doing? What's the weather doing? What's the moon cycle doing? Um, you know, what resources do I have? What airlift do I have? Um, and then we would analyze those factors through by sort of challenging um, and asking the question, so what? And we would make deductions based on so what until we arrived um, with a deduction that led us to an addressable task. And once we had that addressable task, we would ensure that that task was somehow dealt with in our plan. In the world of investing, the factors will be different. It might be what's the market doing? What are your competitors doing? What's foreign exchange rates doing? Um, you know, and, and you want to so what those factors until you have an addressable task. Now, planning um, is kind of a controversial sort of topic, but I've always been a big believer in the process of planning is what's critically important. Um, but as we all know from our time in the service, no plan survives contact with the enemy. So from a leader and a founder's perspective, an ability to demonstrate characteristics of agility and flexibility um, while executing your plan, but being able to pivot based on chain, rapid changes to the situation, I think are critically important. Um, and, and with that, I'm gonna sort of turn it over to Joseph um, to kind of maybe just round out to see if there's anything I missed. Joseph, if you're cool doing that. Yeah, I'll just be super quick. You did a great job of explaining where I was gonna go. But to Kevin, to your point, there are so many tools that we learned how to use in the military that the civilian world did a brilliant job of making even better to Glenn's point about how you analyze. But I'm just a huge fan of CRM tools and I have no idea why more entrepreneurs do not effectively use them, specifically tracking the pipeline, whether it's pipeline of customers, pipeline of partners, pipeline, pipeline of investors, keeping them in the right buckets and moving it forward. Uh, and that for me, the success that I enjoyed in the private sector all came from the rigor of being in the, you know, platoon headquarters, the squadron headquarters, the division headquarters, and learning how to do that planning. So I'll just throw that out. Okay, Chris, did you have anything to add or was that for the next question? Uh, no, I'll add on to this one if that's all right. So, uh, Kevin, what I think your question is really getting at is what are the tools that an investor might use with uh, – with the investor, with the investments leadership team, or with the uh, the startups leadership team, uh, and one of the things that we did, uh, so we at the behest of an investor, the CEO and I, and I'm the CEO, we sat down with the business coach, and the business coach worked with us on a personality assessment, uh, and then put it side by side just to make sure that we weren't like basically the exact same person with the exact same style. Uh, and it turns out that you know Henry and I actually have complementary skill sets. Uh, we found this to be so valuable that we actually brought her in to then do the same thing with the rest of the leadership team. So the head of marketing, the head of sales, the head of finance, uh, myself, uh, and then the head of uh, uh, engineering. Um, and so we, uh, we learned an awful lot about each other through this process. So I think that was uh, really helpful. It's something that uh, it was done at the behest of an investor. So investors might ask for that kind of thing. And it can give them some insight so they can make a better assessment of how strong uh, the leadership team is. Hey, thank you, Chris. Uh, valuable. We, we do have another question, I believe, and give me one second. It's from Ian, and things are jumping around here. Ian Simons. Uh, the question is, why do you think that many companies do not have assessments for an onboarding candidates or a continuing candidate who wants to advance? And I think Fran wanted to take first uh, shot at this. Yeah, thanks, Mike, and thanks, Ian. This is this is a good question, and what I'll what I'll say, and Mike talks about this in in the book in Talent War, is that assessments are hard. Uh, and in order to have an assessment, you have to know what you're looking for. 
And so what you find is that a lot of companies and a lot of leaders, they struggle with identifying what assessment they're going to actually give, whether it be somebody that they're recruiting into the organization or how they're going to assess somebody for future potential or even how they're currently doing their job, because they may not have sat down and done the exercise to truly understand what is it that I want to see. Uh, what does the organization need? And what are, what are the characteristics of culture? What are the characteristics of that role? Uh, and so what happens is you end up in a default situation where you just look at tasks and you say, well, I need this role to do certain tasks. And then you define uh, performance based on a certain set of tasks, but you don't look at what we kind of often call the, the soft skills and what are the character attributes uh, that are required to be successful in this role. And so when you have an assessment and there's all sorts of assessments, I mean, there's hundreds of, of types Types of assessments that you could use for these things, you have to find the one or the two that are going to achieve what it is that you're actually looking for. And so the first step is to sit down as a leader of an organization or a hiring manager and say, here's what I want to see. This is how I want to see it. These are the hard skills. These are the soft skills. Uh, and then then you can go out and actually find a way to, to assess that talent, to bring them in or to evaluate them for continued performance or promotion. Fran, I'll just tag on to this. Um, and thank you for, you know, the talent war was all about this. Um, Glenn and Joseph just talked about planning. It's, it's, it's not about the outcome. It's more about the, the, the process of doing it. Uh, I've got many people on here with MBAs. And if they don't have their MBAs, they've been in business for a long time. If I asked you guys how many companies have really demonstrated a great foundation in the people part, um, the answer would probably be very few. I, in my MBA course, in Jim and, and Fran and the others, I, I never went through one class on how to manage talent, about the human resources, the people component uh, uh, of business. And part of it is just doing the process of planning of what you truly need, as Fran just said. And a lot of companies don't do this. When you make the paradigm, the mental paradigm shift as a leader to understanding that when you treat your human capital with the same discipline, rigor, and focus as your financial capital, then things start to change within your organization. The reason I say that is when you have the right people in the right locations within your company, one, you achieve the ultimate form of culture that you're trying to achieve, and that is decentralized command. Knowing that you've got people who are seizing opportunities in the market space, who are solving problems at their level, naturally the byproduct of that is the financial piece will follow. And you want to get the people part first, but a lot of it, and again, we're not taking pop shots at business owners. When you're focused on driving revenue, people become a secondary, or as we say in the military, tertiary uh, concern, or they completely fall off the table altogether because you're putting out tactical fires here and there. You've got to sit down. You have to have the conversations about your people. Uh, you have to conduct, uh, you know, talent uh, assessments. You have to identify where your talent gaps are. You have to do succession planning. You have to put some strategy into that. If you're not, you're setting your organization up for uh, for uh, a hurt locker. Anyone have anything to add on that? You know, I'll, I'll jump in on that one, um, Mike, because um, someone else asked a question about um, a key attribute or, or the one attribute of a highly successful uh, venture capitalist. And I think you actually summarize that um, pretty well. It's the ability, in my view, um, to see a market opportunity um, and a technology that's going to solve that problem and map that with um, an individual or a set of individuals uh, who can execute uh, against it. Um, if you go to just about any venture capital website, um, they will always talk about the entrepreneurs and the founders. Uh, and the general um, paradigm is that um, you'd rather back a B technology with an A team um, than an A technology with a, a B team. Obviously, ideally, um, you'd wanna find both, um, but um, that team or those that founding team or the individuals uh, who you first meet um, are basically the people who you're deciding to invest in. It's less about the technology. It's less about the market opportunity. They matter, please don't misunderstand me, uh, but people have to execute against it. And I think the best venture capitalists are the folks who understand uh, what Mike was talking about. Um, the founders of organizations um, often don't scale to be the CEOs from inception all the way through. Um, they have a particular skill set, whether it's technical, whether it's in sales, whether it's in operations. And the ones that have um, been the most successful, at least 
um, in my portfolio and my investing over the last uh, 20 plus years um, has really been around the people who are able to recruit um, and find the right people um, who buy into the vision. Um, but as Mike said, have the ability to solve problems at their level, take initiative and make things happen. And then those founders or those founding teams also have the confidence to have vulnerability, as in um, they're not afraid to ask for help when they need it um, or seek out answers to questions um, that they may not know the answers to. And they're also self-aware enough to know when they've grown out of their position. Um, there are a lot of folks who, uh, as I like to say, have succeeded themselves uh, out of a particular job. Doesn't mean they can or should leave the company, um, but um, it does mean um, that they need to bring in talent um, to help them um, be successful. And so the, the best VCs are the ones who basically understand what Mike was talking about, matching those individuals um, to their skill sets um, to solve a very complex problem uh, where um, the inputs um, and the markets are, are changing in real time. Hey, Jim, that, that's powerful. Um, you know, I'm going to open, we'll, we'll, we'll take this one later, but I'm interested. I mean, what you guys are saying is venture is not for everyone. It's actually for a small percentage of people. Um, and, and you all have led startups. Um, we'll come back to it. So you have time to think, but do you guys remember what the attrition rates were? I know for my startups, I don't want to say we churned through people, but you identified real quickly who could work in a resource constrained environment and who had the mentality to deal with the, because let's be honest, venture and entrepreneurship is the high of the highs and the low of the lows. I could be on top of the world one day and the next day, I'm literally in the fetal position on my couch wondering if I'm going to make payroll. So think about that, but we're going to move to this next question. And it's actually timely because it talks about resources. So from Jared Smith, and this is a good one. And, and I do want to address this before I open it up to the group. Applying these uh, planning concepts from military, military service is great and applicable, but the missing topic is resource constraints. How is it managed in a for-profit endeavor? And the question sort of jarbled where I'm going to assume resources are, are constrained. And before I turn it over to the group, I think one of the biggest misnomers is that the military has all the resources that it needs. And yeah, I'm going to see some heads that are, that are shaking. Often we did not have what we need and we had duct tape, uh, wire, and, and some other, uh, you know, uh, totally uh, unapplicable uh, resource that we had to create, become innovative, adaptive, and to solve, uh, you know, whatever problems we were faced with. But guys, I know what he's, what Jared is referring to. It sometimes feels like you're so limited. And let's be honest, I think the number one failure for growth for, for most startups is lack of capital. So how, how do you uh, apply this, the, these military leadership strategies and tactics to, to be successful in venture with limited yeah. uh, constrained right. resources? I, can I jump in there real quick? And it goes to the idea, I don't care what group you're in, it all goes down to hustle and creativity. So when we ended up in, this would have been uh, fall of 2006, we were originally supposed to be going to Baghdad. They shifted everything around. They sent our squadron up to Mosul. We didn't have any of the carryover. We didn't have any of the continuity. We didn't even do the left seat, right seat ride. We literally just showed up. One of the very first things that we ran out of were windshields. We were getting stuff cracked and blown up so much that we were running out of windshields. And so what I ended up having to do was get really creative and reach out and find the manufacturer, not just like the name of the company. I went around through the backside of the internet, found out who those people were and emailed them directly to say, do you know that we are running out of your windshields in Iraq? And lo and behold, after about three or four weeks, we had stacks of windshields all across the motor pools. So your hustle and your creativity will only be limited by you as the entrepreneur. And so whether you're resource constrained or not, go out and get shit done. Yeah, if I could piggyback on that one, uh, Joseph, I think you're you're spot on. And, and um, I'm going to follow you up with a little West Point bias, maybe. Um, one of the most important things that I learned uh, at the academy was my freshman year uh, called the plebe year. Um, you're a plebeian, meaning commoner. Um, you come out of high school thinking you're um, uh, anything and everything, and um, you get beat down, um, much like um, in the military and, and certainly in special operations situations. And um, our freshman year, we only had four responses. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. No excuse, ma'am. Or ma'am, I do not understand. 
that was it. And the most common response was no excuse, ma'am, or no excuse, sir. The most important thing I learned in the military were three simple words, make it happen, period, stop. And that's what it takes to be successful in a startup. Um, you are resource constrained from day one and you continue to be. And in fact, many problems happen when some companies are overcapitalized. They actually don't know what to do with all the money that they've raised. Uh, but your job is to make it happen. No one cares if um, the customer uh, says all of a sudden they don't want it or don't want it anymore. Um, no one cares that your marketing plan didn't work. No one cares um, that um, the technology didn't get delivered on time. Your job is to make it happen, period, stop. Um, and resources be damned. Um, you have a mission, you have an objective, you have goals, and you either accomplish them or you don't. Yeah, it sounds like some of you rode around in Humvees that had vinyl doors also. Uh, if you're picking, if you're deciding what we, what material you like, you probably wouldn't pick vinyl, right? Um, so look, uh, uh, J Jim mentioned an interesting point that some companies actually have plenty of resources and they raise a pile of money. Uh, we've had lots of examples of this, especially over the last couple of years. Um, we work raised all the money in the world uh, and then had a, a kind of a fabulous collapse. Uh, now the company's still around and they're gonna try to figure out how to pivot and how to evolve, uh, but this is an example of an enormous amount of money that was raised. Same thing with Quibi. Uh, Quibi raised billions of dollars um, and then uh, had to uh, had to call it quits. Uh, and think about all the other uh, entrepreneurs that could have used some of that funding had it been allocated differently. So there's lots of examples of people having plenty of resources and still not figuring it out. Uh, and there's uh, this giant misconception that uh, the lack of capital is what sinks most startups. Uh, but this has been studied too. Uh, and actually what sinks most companies is they build something that actually nobody wants. Uh, and so we could spend an entire semester talking about customer development and customer validation, how to make sure that what you're building has demand and that the market wants what you're building and the price point that you want to issue it. Uh, but at the end of the day, you've got to build something uh, that a market really wants. Uh, and if you do that at the early stage, the capital will flow later. Uh, in some cases, some people are able to raise a pile of money early on, uh, and they probably shouldn't have. Uh, so you, you want to watch out for that. But always make sure that you're building something that somebody wants. And there are techniques for how to do that now. Guys, I've got a great question here. And we'll, we'll end on this question, and I want to go around for final comments from the room. But this is from Cole in uh, Canada. I actually know Cole, so does Glenn. Uh, very innovative uh, idea in the security sector. And Glenn has investors, and we've all seen this. There, there's a difference between certain types of private equity and venture uh, capitalists that understand the importance of people, and then the others that just look at hard numbers. So Glenn's, uh, I'm sorry, Cole's question is great. Many businesses are looking at rapid growth in purchasing or investing in material assets to drive additional revenue. Many investors deem this as the sole focus to business success. But what is the best approach to conventional investors to get them to understand the smart use of investment dollars towards well-placed talent acquisition and talent strategy? So you said we weren't gonna do a stump to chump question, Mike. Cole, this is a great question. Uh, and, and like Mike said, I know Cole quite well. So I'd love to get the, the other uh, perspective from the group. Uh, but what I can tell you is, you know, he's building an incredible tech company, um, making some, you know, incredible inroads uh, with um, with Defense Primes. I'd love to just give him a shout out. Uh, the company is Pegasus Imagery out of Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Uh, and Cole is going to change the way uh, that we do intelligence, surveillance, target acquisition and reconnaissance collection. So, Cole, thanks for your question. Uh, hit me up. Um, but let's not let's not waste the opportunity of some of the other uh, thoughts on the call. I think the quick and easy answers, and uh, this was described well in the talent book. You know, the the talent war, which is where do you put your talent team? Uh, are they underneath finance? Are they underneath compliance? Are they somewhere else in the company or do they get to talk to the CEO? Because if that's the case, if they're at the table, literally and figuratively, if they're reporting directly into the CEO, that means that that organization values talent above all things. Uh, and we know from experience, all of us, that whether it be in the military or on teams, I'd rather have a smaller team with a lot of hustle 
than a large team, as Chris and Jim were saying, that are overburdened by having so much money that they're hiring more people than they really need. So I think it's all about how you value people and the resources and where you put them. You know, Joseph, that's a good one, guys. People get fixated on quantity. In fact, it is where our culture is going with social media. Oh, by the way, guys, if you don't know, I have uh, 11,000 followers on LinkedIn, just so you know. Um, it doesn't matter. So you all know uh, Charlie Beckwith was the founder of Delta Force. He was a Vietnam veteran. He once said, I'd rather go down the river into enemy territory with seven studs than 100 idiots. Let's put it that way. So quality, a small, high-performing team uh, is much more valuable than just a, a, a large force. I mean, it goes to Price's Law that a, uh, a, a, a very strong amount of the results produced by your uh, workforce are actually only produced by your, your high performers. Um, so um, I actually want to ask one more question. To what degree, for, for the people listening, are you – sort of evaluating potential VCs to make sure that it's a good fit. I mean, this goes to Cole's question. I mean, what are some tactics to, 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 to utilize to make sure that the venture capitalist that you may allow to invest in your company truly values things that you value or puts, puts a pre precedence on, on people? Yeah, that, that's such an important point, um, Mike. Um, so many people go out and they decide it's uh, time to raise money. Um, and they pull up a list and they just start sending off emails and trying to get meetings and they walk in. They've done absolutely no homework on uh, who you are, what you invest in, what your principles are. Um, they've done um, no due diligence with any of your portfolio companies, CEOs or founders uh, to see what it's like to work with you. Um, to Cole's question, you know, it's important to make the pitch to your investors on what the return on investment is for those individuals who you want to bring on board, because particularly in the early days, uh, people wear multiple hats. And so you've got to have great quality talent to be able to wear those hats um, and achieve uh, your objectives. Um, but again, Mike, I think it's so important that uh, founders and um, early teams, when they're going out and raising money, do your homework. It is a partnership. It's not a one way street. Uh, people don't just write a check and then walk away. Um, uh, the best ones anyway. Um, don't just show up once a month or once a quarter at a board meeting, uh, beat you up for the fonts on your PowerPoint and say you missed your sales numbers and then go away. Um, you want them to be involved. You want to exploit their networks and you want to have a common understanding of integrity and duty and being mission driven and what you believe it takes to be successful matching up with them. Um, if that's not the case, um, it can be a recipe for um, uh challenging circumstances, um, let's say. So it's really important that it be a two-way street. Yeah, I'm going to piggyback on what Jim said too. Uh, two key points there. And this is coming from the perspective of being inside of a startup and seeking out that investment is the due diligence and the partnership. So the first time I started meeting with investors for my company, I did exactly what Jim just said. I blasted out pitch decks to 20, 30 different investors who said they were in the e-commerce realm or in the realm that we were looking at. And then once you actually start to sit down and meet with them, you kind of see there's there's no real synergy there for what you're looking to do in the future and what they're looking to invest in. So the key there is the partnerships, being able to find, this is from the startup's perspective, being able to find those investors who are willing to bring more to the table potentially than just capital. Capital is great, but also you, you want to find those investors who are going to bring that mentorship, who have that network that can connect you with the right people, the right talent potentially to bring you along, that can tell you those honest truths when your company needs to make a change. Maybe you're looking at investing in really expensive property in Austin, Texas, and that doesn't make sense for your business's model right now. You need someone that's going to be there with that experience and wherewithal to tell you that's wrong and be honest with you. So I think that the partnership key that, that Jim just mentioned is something that is oftentimes really overlooked and both sides really have to do that due diligence on each other in order to make sure that that, that part. And a couple really of points works. I'll add, uh, an investor mentor of mine said that it's probably easier to divorce your spouse than to divorce one of your investors, especially an institutional investor. Uh, they're with you for the long haul, yep. uh, whether you like them or not. Uh, so uh, one technique that you can use is to reference check your prospective investors. Uh, any institutional investor, you should reference check. And so you do that by networking with other entrepreneurs and asking them about what it was like to work with XYZ investor. 
Um, if you're working with angels or individuals, it's a little different. They're not going to have as much power and they're probably not putting as much money in. Uh, but the reference check is the, uh, is the key technique. You want to make sure that your values align uh, and that those investors, uh, you know, Tom and uh, Jim covered the partnership angle flawlessly. Uh, but uh, the reference check is the technique. Thanks. So, Chris, you're spot on on the values piece, and that was where I was going to take this. And I know we're getting short on time and we're going to go that direction. So it, it's about the values, because one of the biggest things coming from being inside of the, the startup is that you have to remember that a lot of the uh, investors were at one point, uh, they were. Uh, they were leading that startup. They were at the front end of building that thing. And so if you have, if you can find someone who shares your values and shares your, uh, your character, uh, then that's going to be a partnership that's going to last for a long time. I know for me, uh, when I look at the traits and there's a lot of characteristics that you can assess leaders on and, you know, Mike highlights them in the book uh, and, and they're great, um, you know, but you have to narrow that down. You're never going to find someone who has every characteristic of someone great. And so for me, if I'm looking at someone uh, that I'm going to partner with, you know, it's going to be someone who has integrity. They have to have drive. They have to have humility and they have to have resiliency. If you can have those four things, uh, those are the things that for me are going to be successful. So, you know, it's where the rubber meets the road and we all know, when you've got a potential investor with maybe a, a, a you know few million dollars and their values don't align, that puts you in a tough situation when you, you're, you're cash strapped and you need it. Um, you know, I, I think the advice from the group is is just hold off. There, there's something around the corner that's there's there's the right investor whose values are going to align with yours. But when you you make a bad decision and align with somebody that you know Simon Sinek talk, talks about it, high performance, low trust. You, you'll never go get over that trust issue. Trust is uh, is everything. Um, let's switch back to uh, panel view. Uh, so here at Talent War Group, we we are all predominantly military, with the exception of Michelle. Uh, it's her best quality. Uh, we at the end of every military meeting, we we have a term say, which is, are there any saved rounds? And what that means is, are there any last comments? So to the group, to the listeners, one, this has been valuable. We could probably go on for another five hours and we actually may have to do another session, a part two to this. But to the group, are there any safe grounds, any nuggets that you want people to, to understand and take away from this? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, to the point on, I think uh, uh, Joseph or Jim raised it on evaluating the VC to come in, uh, to come in as a partner. Uh, just remember, uh, VCs, certainly, you know, smaller ones like myself, we're entrepreneurs too. Uh, we're, we're going through the same iterative processes of some of our startups. Uh, we're building our own teams. Uh, and, you know, we are out pounding the pavement with our limited partners um, and building pretty thick skin uh, as it pertains to resiliency and continuing to be true to our message and stay disciplined to the investing approach of our thesis. Thanks, Mike. I'll jump in real quick. Um, um, great panel and, and really appreciate the opportunity to participate. Um, the, my final comment would be, um, you know, the arc of investing and the arc of entrepreneurship is, is long. Um, relationships matter, character matters, uh, integrity matters. Um, one of my favorite entrepreneurs, a guy named Mike Wider, who started a company called uh, Locked Fire um, in the uh, cybersecurity space uh, out of Canada. Ontario, so shout out to you there, Glenn. Um, um, he was great because um, he started as the founder and the CEO, uh, came to me and the other investors and said, um, uh, I've grown out of this position and I'm more positioned to be the CTO. Uh, we brought in a great CEO that met with our values, but had the operational discipline and leadership uh, to get us to a successful exit. Um, I'm very proud of that investment. Um, I've had other investments um, that have been sold or gone public in the billions of dollars. And um, I've been investing for over 20 years. Um, the most, uh, the thing I'm most proud of uh, is not my track record. The thing I'm most proud of is that I can pick up the phone and call Mike Wider and um, talk to him about his kids and um, see what he's go what's going on for him in the world. And when I see uh, an interesting company that I think may be relevant to his skill set. Um, I can reach out to him and have him help me do due diligence, make introductions to strategic partners and, and customers. So again, relationships matter, character matters. Um, uh, no one um, will be on their first rodeo by the time they're done. Um, that's very rare. 
And so developing those relationships and those skill sets uh, will come in handy, not only today, but five, 10, 20 plus years from now. Well said, Jim. I'll be quick, Mike and Glenn. Thanks for inviting me. My final thought is building off of Jim's point, which is the good investors know that the first idea that comes to them from that particular entrepreneur will not be what actually sees the light of day. They're investing in you and your flexibility or adaptability or agility, how you work as a team. And they're less worried about that first hockey stick curve you show them. So always remember it's about the relationships you build. So powerful. You know, Jim, I, I actually feel blessed that I can pick up the phone and call any of you guys. You know, my mom used to say, tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you are. And this is the power of the talent world group. And this is why I assembled this. I basically assembled uh, 45 people that are more intelligent and more high performing than I am. And I learned from all of them. So Fran, Tom, Chris, Jim, Joseph, Glenn, thank you. Now what truly matters and how we, uh, after Save Grounds, how we close this out is we all believe we're stewards of our leadership experiences and our legacy and leadership is not what we do when we're alive. It's how we've set up the next generation. And Michelle, you are the next generation. As a young leader, what are the top three points you took away from this? And I swear to God, I'd better be one of those top three points or we're going to have a discussion. For, I'm joking. What are the top three points? Thank you, Mike. I actually, I have like my name Paul school with so much that I learned today. Thank you so much to everybody. It was an honor being here with everybody. And it's interesting that we finished off with that last conversation because my first point was from Joseph from the very beginning where he said to young uh, entrepreneurs, the first impression is when it starts. Every email exchange and how you treat their team matters. And it's when people will decide if they will invest not only their money, but their time in you. Uh, time is just as important as money and if not more valuable, it's their knowledge and it's everything from there. Second uh, was from Fran. He started off and said, no problem is too large. Solutions are out there. You just need the right people to solve them. This point, I kind of tied it up into something from everybody where Tom afterwards said that people was the most were the most important part. Being able to roll and be flexible. Leaders must be able to adapt. I kind of took this back to our last discussion with Lisa and Glenn, where we talked about being the Swiss army knife and not the screwdriver and learning to adapt to different scenarios and different stuff thrown at you, uh, being versatile and making yourself a generalist. Uh, however, from the hiring perspective, uh, Fran talked also about assessments being hard, identifying what you're looking for, having the right people at right locations. Uh, and then for my third point was from Glenn, who said, what makes special operations special is the ability to do the basics brilliantly, uh, which was just keeping it simple, starting from the planning process. Uh, you may have a ton of questions, a ton of check marks, but just kind of doing a so what process until you have an addressable task, something that's uh, that you can tackle and that you can go on from. Well, it's no surprise that Michelle is the best spoken out of uh, all of us. I don't think that's going to hurt anyone's ego. Uh, <laughs> Michelle, that, that, that is powerful. I, I can't think of a better coaching and mentorship session uh, for, for someone at your tenure in, in your professional career coming out of college. So thank you for those uh, points. Guys, closing this out, again, thank you to all of you. Thank you to all those who joined us. Hey, listen, if you want to talk with any of these exceptional leaders, go to thetalentwar.com. Go to the Talent War Group on that page. There's a contact. You can book them. You can bring them into, into your organization. This is what they love doing. They love setting up organizations for success. Guys, thank you. Uh, next session is on Thursday, same time, led by Dan Bradley with a special guest, Chad Hennings, who not only was U.S. Air Force Academy, sorry, Jim and, and Joseph, uh, three-time Super Bowl champion with the, the, the Dallas uh, Cowboys, Oh, and also a uh, fighter pilot. Uh, no big deal. I, I could say you're, he's the uh, triple threat. And the discussion for that one is two is one, one is none. Uh, the need for redundancy in organizations when you're building your team so that you prevent critical points of failure. So please tune in at 12 p.m. on Thursday for that session. All of you, thank you for your time. We're out. Have a good one.